Hi everyone, my name is Steph Keeler. I'm a science teacher here at Sequoia Mid-High High School. And today I thought we would go over some invertebrate anatomy. Next week or in the near future, I believe some of the other science teachers are gonna do some vertebrate anatomy. And so I thought, well, I might as well go ahead and talk about some neat invertebrate species. Uh, I did wanna jump back to last week's lesson really quickly. Uh, one of the questions I got from multiple people was, why would you take the DNA out of a strawberry? Like, what's the purpose behind that? And so you can kind of follow it through not just for strawberries, but you can take the DNA out of all those eukaryotic cells and then compare it. You can look at it and sequence it. Um, that's basically the uh, idea behind the 23andMe kits that you see advertised on TV. We can extract the DNA from cells and then compare the DNA. What do we have in common? What's different? And then the more common links you have, you can show that that's the ancestry of it. So that was kind of the idea behind why people would extract DNA from a cell. Today with the invertebrate anatomy, I just kind of want to go through a general zoology introduction. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is just all animals together. Doesn't matter if it's a vertebrate or an invertebrate, but what do all animals have in common? Um, when I do this lesson in zoology class, I typically start by giving all of the students a blank piece of paper and I ask them, write down 20 animals. And at least 15, if not more, of their 20 animals are all mammals, because that's what we think of automatically as an animal. But there's so much more out there, and that's not even a, a big part of the animal species. It's just what we think of, because that's what we have contact with, with our cats and our dogs. So there's a whole bunch of different types of animals out there, but the things that they have in common is what links them into that animal group. A lot of zoology is classification. How do we classify them? Are they similar, or are they different? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at similarities and differences of uh, adaptations that they have. So when we look at animals, there's a couple different things that they have in common. Most of it's at the cellular level, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. We're going to say, oh, this is a whole giraffe, but look at its cells and tell me if it's really an animal or if it's a plant. The first thing that they have is that they're called auto, I'm sorry, they're called heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that have to consume food in order to maintain their metabolism. The opposite of a heterotroph is called an autotroph. An autotroph will usually uh, create its own food most of the time through photosynthesis, but there's also another process called chemosynthesis that they can use. But animals can't do that. They cannot photosynthesize. They don't do chemosynthesis. When they get their own food source, it can be by eating uh, other animals. It could be by eating plants. It can be even parasitically. But all of those go into the fact that they are taking an energy from another organism. Uh, the second thing that we talk about with animal species is that they're all multicellular. The prefix multi means many, and so you have to have more than one cell working together. They have specialized uh, jobs. There's skin cells, there's muscle cells, there's all kinds of different materials and tissues that go into making our different organs, and that complexity makes them multicellular. Um, another thing that you can talk about is the fact that they all need oxygen in order to survive. Be careful when you look at the word oxygen versus air. Sometimes we just confuse that because we're breathing air. We think, oh, we're breathing oxygen, but you're actually breathing a whole bunch of nitrogen and a bunch of other gases that are in there as well. We take out the oxygen using our lungs and exchange it for carbon dioxide, but all animals need to be able to do that. When a fish is in water, he needs to be able to extract that oxygen differently. Differently, he extracts it from the dissolved oxygen that's in the water and then also gives off carbon dioxide. So they are breathing the oxygen that's in the water, okay? If you use lungs or gills, it doesn't matter. If you're taking in that oxygen, you can still be considered an animal. So those are the main characteristics that we look at. Uh, the other one is that they're eukaryotic. Last week, we talked about the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote. Eu means true and it's literal translation and karyote is nucleus. So when we talked about taking that nuclear nuclear envelope off of the DNA, all animals have to have that nuclear envelope around their DNA. That's what's going to qualify them as an animal. Okay, so when I look at these pictures, and I know they're really hard to see, but there's a couple different pictures here. We have a salamander, we have an alligator, there's a fish here, we have a mammal, and we have a bird. All of these guys are animals. They have all those four characteristics that I just talked about, but they also have a backbone, and that backbone makes them a vertebrate species. And you notice a lot of these are really large. They can range in size a lot. Size is not going to be a quality a qualification of being an animal. You can be really big or you can be really small, but these vertebrate species all have a backbone that protects their spinal cord. 
in contrast to that, in comparison to that, we're going to look at some different invertebrate species today. So the four invertebrates that I put up here are an octopus, an earthworm, there's a grasshopper with really brilliant wings down here, and then a crayfish. And when we look at these, they're also animals. They have, they have those four characteristics that I mentioned, but they're lacking a backbone and so we're going to call them invertebrates they are not vertebrate species the thing about invertebrates is they range in complexity quite a bit okay there are sponges which are the simplest animal out there and some people think oh they must be a plant because they don't move but they can't make their own food they're heterotrophs they have to take in food from their environment um, all the way up to uh, the echinoderms like a starfish or in any of these cases so the octopus is really really advanced versus a really simple like sea anemone that nemo lives in okay okay there's a a wide range of complexity here okay so what the main word is I want to talk about today is just adaptations. And I'm going to focus mostly on invertebrates, but adaptations are just characteristics that help animals to either survive or thrive in their environment. Okay. And so here we have a picture of a dromedary camel. And one of the things that you're going to pick out, pick out an adaptation that this camel has. What is something that makes it a camel? How do you know that's not a giraffe? How do you know that that's not a whale? Okay, those are the adaptations that it has. So I would notice that it has fur, so it's going to be a mammal. But the main thing I, I usually notice about the camel is the hump. And there's two different types of camels. The dromedary camel is this one. He has one hump right there, and that is an adaptation to allow him to survive in really dry climates. Okay, some people have the misconception that it's just filled with water. It's not. It's filled with fat as well. And the health of the camel can sometimes be determined by how um, much this is filled. If it looks like it's kind of bending over a little bit, they may be malnourished or they may have used some of the resources out of there. But if they go for three or four days without any nutrition or water, they can still survive because this adaptation allows them to live in a dry environment. It's just something that they have that allows them to thrive where other organisms may not be able to. You're probably not going to see a whole lot of frogs out there because it's too dry. Their skin has to stay moist and that's their adaptation. They have to stay near a moist environment. Okay. So adaptations for invertebrates specifically, it says allows them to thrive in their environment. And so I just picked one off of the internet. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, this crab, he has a lot of adaptations and we're gonna compare him to a crayfish here in a little bit. But the one that I picked out says the fifth and back pairs of the legs are used for swimming. And so if you notice these, these legs right here are fairly thin and these guys back here are wider, okay? It says the legs are often flat like paddles okay think about the fins of a fish they're flat they want to have as much surface area we talked about how important surface area is last week the more surface area you have the more you can do and so the bigger the fin like i think of a caudal fin or a tail fin on a fish it allows it to propel forward the fins all have a different job but the flatter it is the more impact it has on the water as it's moving through there so this is when they're obviously aquatic but they're going to use them to paddle through the water okay so add a just what makes it different and why do they have that? So we're going to look at three different invertebrates today to compare their adaptations. If I get to all three, I may only get to two today. The first one that I'm going to look at is a squid. I think this squid is probably one of my favorite invertebrates that we dissect through zoology because it has so many unique adaptations. I want to mention really quickly the classification. Uh, when we look at different animal species, we're going to classify them through eight different levels. Uh, they're called taxonomic levels. The big one is the kingdom and the domain at the top. The domain is Eukara, which means that they all have a cell with a nucleus inside of it. And then the next one is the animal kingdom. And everything we look at today is going to be in the animal kingdom. Other kingdoms include the plant kingdom, the protists. Uh, there's two different bacteria kingdoms. And then the one I'm missing, fungus. And then there's a fungus kingdom as well. Only going to look at animals today. So again, these would be things that they have in common. And then I'm going to start to break them down and look at how they're different. This is in a the, the next class or the next classification is called phylum. And it's mollusca. We usually just call them mollusks. Okay. So it says, what characteristics do the mollusks have that put them into this group? The word translation is how I usually go about deciding what they are. Mollusca just means soft-bodied. Well, a whole lot of invertebrates could fit into that. And so we kind of look for other classifications as well. Most mollusks are going to have a shell. Not all, 
but most will have a shell. And so start thinking about invertebrates, so no backbone, that have a shell. You can't put a turtle in there because if you've ever found a turtle shell out in the pasture somewhere, when you flip it over, there's a backbone that goes right down through the middle of it. So he's a vertebrate species, so we got to get rid of him right away. The invertebrate species that have a shell will be like your snails. Um, the slugs fit in there as well. They're just a snail without a, a shell. Uh, you could put in there clams and oysters and um, mussel species. But the squid octopus also fit into this group. They have primitive shells that are actually internal, and I'll try and show you that a little bit today. They're kind of hard to see, okay? So when I look at this species, I remember soft-bodied, and for me, the squid kind of looks like that. Okay, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you a squid, and Mr. Berg is going to try and zoom in on this squid as best that he can. Do you want me to move to the front? Would that be easier? I think we'll do that. Okay, and so here's my, here's my squid. <laughs> and this is what I noticed first about the squid. Um, he has two big triangular fins at the top. There's a body right here, and then there's these tentacles and arms that come down. The first thing I ask students to do when they look at these different species is find the top, the bottom, uh, and those are going to be referred to as dorsal and ventral. Okay, and so when I look at this squid on the this side, you notice that it's really dark and he has like a, this section right here is called the mantle. It comes into a point that's going to be the dorsal side or the uh, top side. And then I can flip him, o him over and on the bottom side, let me find my probe really quickly. Sorry. On the bottom side, he has a siphon right here. Okay, this is where he's able to get rid of a lot of different materials, okay? So that's his ventral side. This is ventral and this is dorsal, but big things that we want to look at instead. So this section right here is the mantle and what makes these mollusks fit into this group is this mantle typically will create a shell. The thing about the squid shell is that it's inside, okay? When I lift this up or when I open them up, when I do an internal dissection, I cut right here and there's a pen, it's called. It's a little uh, shell that goes on the inside here. Why on earth would a squid need a little bit of a shell? Well, it's kind of a vestigial structure. They're not using it a whole lot anymore, but it gives them something to contract against. Uh, this squid can take this mantle and you can kind of look at it. Um, well, if you're here he can. <laughs> this is a balloon shape almost. You can open it up and he can put a whole bunch of water in here and that water will give his body some support. But at the top, because he's in the water, he probably wants to have some fins. So these two fins at the top come to a point, but they help him to maneuver in the water. Okay. They're steering, uh, not so much propulsion. He can't use them for propelling forward like the tail fin, but he can use them for steering and for balance. Uh, the thing I like best about the squid is, if you'll notice, he's got these dark spots right here. And when you get really close to them, they almost look like freckles. Those little freckles are called chromatophores. The prefix chromo means color. And what is unique about the squid and the octopus is that they can change color in less than a second. They can change a lot of colors. It's not just like um, a chameleon that might just go green and then go back to brown. They can flash different colors in less than a second. What happens is these little individual freckles have a mu muscle around them, a circular muscle. And when you can, when the squid contracts it or expands it, it allows it to change colors. Uh, they can use this color change for a couple different when it wants to uh, or when it's getting ready to have a feeding frenzy. If there's a lot of food around, they get really excited like I do and they're going to flash these colors and it lets the other squid know there's food available. And so you'll see them flashing. It almost looks like light coming through the water in, in different depths, but it's not. It's actually the squid producing these colors. They have three different colors of chromatophores, but they can make multiple colors just like you learned in art class on Tuesday. They can mix colors together and appear to be different colors. The octopus does it even more so for camouflage. Uh, I have this really neat video you can look up where an octopus appears to look like a bush on the bottom of the ocean. It's just seaweed kelp, but they call it a bush in the video. And he blends in so well, you cannot see that octopus until he moves. When the photographer gets really close, he flashes and moves on. Okay, so those are the chromatophores. The most people uh, recognize the squid and the octopus for having a siphon. There's a tube on the underside or the ventral side right here. It doesn't look like much, but this tube is in charge of a lot of materials. Okay, it's just a 
it's just a big tube. And what happens is they can use it to fill up their scythe or their mantle and fill up with water and then push it out through this opening at the bottom. And the opening at the bottom gives them some jet propulsion to get away from a predator fairly quickly. They are really yummy for a lot of different species in the ocean. And so they'll use that siphon to escape. Um, the other thing that you'll notice, how many arms does an octopus have? Like the cousin here has eight, octo means eight. My squid actually has 10 little appendages here, okay? These 10 little appendages, Eight of them are much shorter than the other. There's two here that are much longer. The longer ones are called tentacles, and the shorter ones are called arms, and every single one of them has these little suction cups on them. Why would a squid need suction cups? Okay. These little suction cups actually range in size. They're very large the closer you are to the top of the squid's arm or tentacle, and then they get smaller towards the bottom. The poor squid doesn't have thumbs. Okay, When I pick up a bag of potato chips, I'm going to grab them and just throw them in my mouth. He's using the using these suction cups the same way. So where's a squid's mouth? That siphon only lets things go out. Things won't go in through the siphon. The water that goes out of the siphon actually comes in through the mantle here. If you open up all these arms, inside of there is his mouth. And so what he'll do is he'll grab it with his tentacles and then throw it into his mouth. Inside of the mouth, I retracted it earlier, he has a very small beak, beak okay? Should use my other pan here. So the beak looks like a little bird beak. If you can see the black points on it here, okay? And it's just like a bird's beak. It doesn't have any teeth. It can tear. So when it captures a fish with those tentacles, it can tear them and put them into their stomach and pass them on down through their esophagus. But the beak is very, very sharp. And I just think it's always so unique. Uh, there's no teeth inside of there, but that's how it's going to capture its food. Use the arms and tentacles, push it in through the beak. And then there's some uh, other appendages. On the octopus, there's a really big eye on this guy. It's really difficult to see, but there's an eye here and there's an eye on the other side. So this is the head region of my squid. And we call him a cephalopod. Cephala means head and pod means foot. And I usually don't think about my head with my feet, but that's what he is. Here's a head. And here's all his feet, okay? And then this whole other region back here is called his visceral mass. All his organs are inside here. His stomach is in here. His reproductive organs are in here. His gills are in here. So everything else is inside of there. But my favorite part of this squid is definitely all his little chromatophores and watching them flash colors. If you get a chance to get online and see that, that's kind of fun, okay? So those are kind of my characteristics of a squid. All right, the second one that I'm going to look at, and probably the final species that I'll look at today, is the, the crayfish. Uh, most of you around here know them as crawdads. They have a bunch of different names. I've been told that they're called mud bugs as well. I believe Miss Trammell probably just calls them dinner. So when we go through and we look at the crayfish, what puts him into the crayfish group? Okay, going back to classification again, first of all, he's in the kingdom Animalia. Okay, he has to eat. He has to have a little cell nucleus inside there. He has to take in oxygen. All of these characteristics still apply that we've talked about with animals today. But now he's in phylum arthropoda. Arthropoda literally means like jointed foot. And so he has to have jointed appendages. And he has these legs here with joints in them. Um, underneath he has some swimmerettes that look like appendages with legs. These big chelipeds have appendages with um, joints inside of them. Okay. There's three characteristics that all arthropods have to have. In addition to being animals, they have to have those jointed appendages, okay? They have to have an exoskeleton. The prefix exo means outside and skeleton, okay? We just think about the exoskeleton. So I always tell kids if it crunches when you step on it, it's probably an arthropod. <laughs> and then they have to have a segmented body, okay? And segmentation sometimes is repeating. You see the same thing over and over again. When you look at his abdomen, and I'll show you this here in a second on the real one, this is a repeating segment on segment on his abdomen, but he has three body segments, okay? He has a head, he has what's called the thorax or the chest cavity, and he has an abdomen. Do I have those things? Yes, I have a head, a chest, and an abdomen, so I'm also segmented, but I don't have an exoskeleton, so I can't, can't be an arthropod, okay? So other arthropods, what crunches when I step on it that has an exoskeleton? All my insects fit in this group, all my crustaceans fit in this group, and all of my spiders, all the arachnids are going to fit in there as well. So lots of examples. The arthropod group is actually the biggest one. All right, so characteristics of my crawdad or my crayfish, okay? When we look at the crayfish, hopefully this is a little easier now to see with the blue background. The first thing I usually notice about the crayfish is the big giant pincers on the front. These guys here on the front are called chelipeds, okay? 
When we look at the chelipeds, what do you think they use those for? We're always talking about adaptations and why do they have it, okay? Not everybody has one, but these chelipeds help them to grasp food. They're pretty much analogous to the suction cup and cups on the tentacles of the squid that we just looked at, okay? They have the same function, but completely different structure, okay? Um, the carapace, the carapace of a crawdad or a crayfish is just this segment right here, okay? It's kind of a shell. It's pretty hard. Um, usually you have to work on getting that open in order to eat them, I believe. All right. At the end, he has this really long, flat tail, and it has five different sections to it. The middle section is called the telson. Um, if you've seen a stingray, not in this group, but he also has a telson, so not a characteristic of just arthropods, this middle section right here, but these are wide and flat. Earlier, we looked at that crab, and he had wide, flat legs. Why does he have those? Okay, they're for swimming. It allows them to move pretty quickly through the water. If you've seen them in the water, they may crawl forward with these walking legs right here, which they have eight of. But if they need to get somewhere in a hurry, they're going to use these uropods and telsons, these flat, large surface areas, in order to move quickly through the water. Okay, with the walking legs here, you can see they're quite large. And what's interesting is if they lose some of these walking legs, eggs actually get them back, okay? The walking legs on a crayfish, bless you, are mostly exoskeleton material. There's going to be some muscle material in there as well, but if these accidentally come off, when he gets a new exoskeleton, which we'll talk about here in a second, he can actually regain some of those legs back. The thing that's interesting about the exoskeleton, my skeleton is called an endoskeleton. Endo, endo means inside. Exo means outside. That endoskeleton grows with me. So as I get bigger or as you get bigger, you're going to see uh, your bones get larger only on an x-ray. When this guy gets larger, his exoskeleton cannot grow with him. He has to molt it, which means he sheds it off and actually kind of climbs out of it and becomes uh very, very fragile for a small period of time until his new exoskeleton hardens. The exoskeleton cannot grow with him. Okay, so what's interesting uh, about the exoskeleton, I always horrify zoology, zoology students that don't like spiders with, is if you see dead spider, spiders in the corner, it's probably not a dead spider. It's probably it's molt, and you really just have larger spiders now. Sorry if that's horrifying, but I think it's funny. Okay, uh, other structures that you notice with the, yes, sir? How long does it take that, that process to happen? The molting itself, shedding that exoskeleton, can be pretty quick, but the hardening can take days. And so a lot of times your species that are arthropods that exoskeletons are molted on will kind of hide somewhere. They need some water to make their hydraulics kind of work, but they'll hide somewhere because they're very, very vulnerable to the environment or predators more so than normal. Um, antennas and antennules. So also you'll notice with some of these crayfish, my little probe here. He has two sets of what look like antennas coming off of here. He has this one really long set of antennas, and then he has a smaller set right here. These smaller ones are called the antennules, and the larger ones are antenna. And this is really just tactile sense. Although these large chelipeds or pincers are for grabbing food and throwing it in the mouth, they got to detect to detect that it's there first, okay? So there's a couple ways that they can do that. They can use this large antenna and antennules, or they can use this beady little eye right here, something that's very uh, common in your arthropods, and I cannot think of other organisms that have them. I think it may be unique to the arthropod group, is this big giant eye here is called a compound eye. There's two different types of eyes in animals. There's a compound and there's a simple eye. The compound eye has a bunch of lenses in it versus my eye, which is just a simple eye, and it has one lens in it, and it can focus it. The advantage of this compound eye is it actually increases the vision range that it has, and the ability to make images is completely different than you would see with a simple eye. So those are some of the adaptations that this crayfish has. His exoskeleton helps to protect him. His chelipeds help chelipeds help him to gain food and then this big tail helps him to swim the uropods and the telson that are in there help him to swim okay so those are yes sir uh those are the different adaptations that we talked about with invertebrate species you can you can look at them in vertebrates as well so i'm going to skip ahead here and not do the earthworm dissection today so let's look at some of these really quickly if you if you can tell this is a clownfish nemo 
living in his house, okay? So what are some adaptations that he has to help him survive and thrive in his environment? Well, we talked about surface area on fins. The bigger his fins are, the quicker he can move. He moves pretty fast, maybe not for long periods of time, but that surface area helps to move him where he needs to go. The other thing that most fish have is a big layer of mucus that helps to protect them. Um, most of the time it's for friction reduction so they can move through the water faster, but he actually has that mucus layer to protect him from his house. This anemone is uh, able to sting species just like a jellyfish does, except for the clownfish. The clownfish mucus layer protects it from the stinging tentacles. So it actually helps this anemone bring in other fish that it can sting and eat, but it actually protects it as well. Okay, uh, the last one that we're going to look at here, obviously we're from Sequoia, so we got to talk about the eagle. What are some adaptations that he has in order to survive or thrive in his environment? Extremely keen east eyesight, big eyes, big wingspan for soaring, which allows him to hunt for a long period of time, and then the talons at the bottom help him to grasp prey. He can tear prey. I've watched the eagles hunt over at Grand, and they're way up high, and then all of a sudden they have a fish. It's these adaptations that allow them to thrive in the environments that they're in. Guys, I hope that you have a great week, and I will see you back here next week. Thank you. Awesome.